so welcome to our welcome to our um, third session. Uh, the driving driving issue, driving subject of, of this session is teaching mathematics and teaching STEM. So uh, I hope you enjoy. Dayon, the floor is yours. Hello again. Hello. <laughs> Good lunch. This is the last time you'll see me over the next two days, I promise. <laughs> um, so for this presentation, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a project that we've been um, working on with some of the schools around the university. Excuse me. I have, I have one, one word. I'm sorry, sure. because I, it is important that I forgot to somebody left the bag in the lunch dining room. Do we know who's like it is? Then, okay, then please continue and I will give it back to the staff because otherwise somebody will be looking for it. Okay. So we're going to look at the ways in which um, engaging students in um, working on this STEM project uh, supported disciplinary and interdisciplinary knowledge development and design thinking um, working on this pre-engineering STEM project. My co-authors are here, Vera Litan and Celeste Nicholas. So I think in the US as well as internationally, there's a lot of concern about, um, this is what I'm not sure what it is, but, um, developing knowledge and integrated knowledge around the STEM disciplines, specifically because of the demand for jobs um, and also I think every nation wants to be competitive internationally, right? In specifically where Indiana University is placed, Indiana University of Bloomington, um, we are in the southwest central Indiana region, um, sorry, southwest central region of Indiana. And one of the counties has the fourth largest concentration of STEM jobs in the US. So you can imagine that just by geographic location, there's a huge demand within our area and in our region and the schools around our region to be producing students with this kind of disciplinary, strong disciplinary content knowledge, but also um, ways of applying that knowledge to meet the job and employment uh, demands, employee demands that are now currently um, in the industry. So a part of us developing this project was to meet both educational and industry needs. Um, it was a call from industry for us to support the school system in creating um, or designing curricula that would support students in developing this knowledge. Um, so it kind of connects with this notion that they're underprepared for the profession, but also not really having rigorous curricula to support them in developing this content knowledge. And so what are we gonna do in terms of thinking about um, how to get kids in from the school or strengthen the school to work pipelines specifically related to STEM jobs? So I'm just gonna pause and give you a little bit of background in how we actually designed the project and then kind of go into some of the conceptual um, ideas that we used to strengthen what we were doing. So in this region around um, Indiana University, we have a huge naval base, and the majority of the jobs that they um, have are engineering jobs. Um, in the next 10 years, about 50% of their employees will resign or retire, um, and then they, so they're in a huge panic about what's gonna happen um, in terms of filling the jobs in the community. Um, and so that, here comes a partnership. So they need to, what's partly going on in the schools, they don't see and we don't see that's going to actually fill this demand. And so we have this program that we've designed, and this was the first um, iteration of it called the Workplace Simulation Project. And what we do is partner schools with industry, and the industry professionals craft a project that they would normally work on as engineers. And what we do is that we help to modify this project in a way that it's consumable or work that students in schools can work on. So we don't make it less rigorous. What we try to do is that we try to find what are the embedded conceptual ideas within this project that we can connect to curriculum. Um, in this particular project we worked on, we were able to connect um, mathematical ideas, physics ideas, computer science ideas, 
Um, and then there is a stream of courses called Project Lead the Way courses, and one of those courses is Principles of Engineering. So we kind of designed the curriculum pulling on concepts from all of these classes, um, and then have the, uh, the students work on the project that were designed by the engineers. One day a week, the engineers come to campus, and they work alongside the students on this project. So if you add it up, you recognize that this is a huge investment on the part of the industry, because they're devoting um, three hours every week across five to six professionals in school over the course of a semester. Um, we were hoping they'd also um, donate some funds, but that's another discussion. <laughs> we just got the time. So it's, it's an engineering project that we're uh, immersing into the K-12 education curricula. Um, and this is kind of the, the perspective that we had in engineering design, a systematic intelligent process in which designers generate, evaluate, and specify concepts for devices, systems, or processes whose form and function achieve client's objectives or user's needs while satisfying a specific set of constraints. So essentially, for this particular company, uh, they, they're contracted by government to design particular things. So if they want to do, we want glasses that we can see at night, night with your goggles. They come, they tell the engineers what they want, and the engineers design it to meet the specifications of what the um, Department of Defense, whoever hires them to do. So that's kind of what they did with the students. They wanted them to design an electronic detection system. I'll just get glasses all that. Um, so for us, some of the the complaints around why kids are not really engaged or they're not learning is one, a lot of what we want them to do is not authentic, right? It's like these artificially created problems, it's not really engaging, no one wants to do it. Um, and it's very, when it is authentic, it's not aligned with the curriculum, so you get pushback from teachers because the teachers need the students to pass the standardized tests. And when they work on these projects, they, whilst they do learn, they don't necessarily learn the content that's going to be covered on the test. And so we were trying to kind of fill these gaps while making sure that the project was still rigorous. We also wanted to make sure that we weren't going to get significant pushback from teachers because it wasn't aligned with their curriculum. So we spent a lot of time making sure that it was aligned with the curriculum, but it would still maintain the authenticity of what the engineers would work on. So much so that they also struggled with the project. So the core research question that we were working on was, will engaging students in this kind of environment actually have them learn more physics, math, computer science, and principles of engineering? And then will it also allow them to respond to questions that kind of integrate all of those uh, concepts in answering really kind of interdisciplinary problems? We were also interested in, would they learn anything about engineering design through the process? Um, how would that kind of interaction um, develop an uh, orientation or perspective on what actually um, engineering design um, conceptualizes? So those were our core research questions for this. So the project, because you know we had to make it exciting and fun all at the same time, was detect, analyze, deter. And they were working on building an electronic detection system to protect a hospital. So let's just say this is just a rough kind of layout of, um, of the, the building that they were designed to protect. And there were specifications. So an intruder could only enter from one wall. So the south wall was the only entry point for the intruder. The intruder would travel in um, only in a linear fashion. And they were going to protect this central spot in the middle of the, um, of the facility. If you notice, there are these two um, one striped that had polka dot. Those were what we would call as those are the drone stations. That's where the the security guard per se would be, um, and then the cameras are located at both ends of the south wall, so that it can actually pick up when an intruder comes in. So we all those specifications were specifically stated so that it would align with the algebra curriculum, and for algebra one. The students are, are working on linear functions. And so we didn't want them to have a situation where the intruder would be traveling in anything that would mirror anything exponential or anything beyond what they could do. So we just had that specification where it would only be able to travel in a straight line. Not very realistic, but it still meant the, the engineers were okay with it. So we were fine. Um, it was broken apart into different subsystems, and each subsystem was assigned to a class. 
um, where they would work on it. So I'm just going to talk specifically about the math, and if you're interested in what the other classes were doing, then you can ask me afterwards, just in the interest of time. So in Mathematics Algebra 1, a core aspect of the curriculum is developing an understanding of, how, of linear functions. Um, and so for the, if I go back to this, for the, for the Algebra 1 students, what they had to do was to determine the path of the intruder. So if the intruder enters in at three different speeds, it could walk, it could run, or it could walk really fast. Um, either of those speeds heading towards the central bunker, what are the different um, paths or trajectories that it could take, um, how fast would it get there, um, and how to determine then what would be the best intersection point for the drone leaving either of the stations. And if you think about it, all of the ideas that they would need to have, all the concepts they would need to understand falls within either pre-algebra or algebra. So speed, time, linear functions, um, they had to do a little bit of trig. Um, but then, you know, that's, it just organically kind of developed from what they had to do. So they would be learning and figuring out how to actually do these because they had to, that was their charge. When they were, they were the intelligence center, they needed to get this information to the drone center in order for the POE students, principals of engineering students, to then tell the drone program to do it, um, at what angle and what speed it would need to be deployed in order to intercept um, the intruder before it got to the central zone. Exciting. <laughs> well, we thought so. So we also wanted it to, to make sure that we weren't being too prescriptive in what they had to do, um, that they had some options of choice. Um, and they actually had to push them to actually learn things in order to create um, what they had to do to develop this electronic perception system. So for several of the students, going through the engineering design process and what it actually entails was, was new for them. For the principal of engineering students, it wasn't completely new. That was a part of their curriculum. But for the algebra students and the physics students, trying things out, having it fail, redesigning, going back, um, keeping that motivation and momentum through the process was something that they, they hadn't experienced before, although they should have, because that's kind of the problem-solving cycle, too. But, um, I won't go too deep into that. As for those who um, are familiar with the inquiry, science inquiry process and the problem solving process, you see that several aspects of this design engineering process maps perfectly onto this trial and error approach to learning and development um, that we thought you know, really connected with the core of what they should be learning anyway. So you see this picture with some students and engineers kind of working on, um, on, on building the breadboard uh, for, the, for the camera to set it up and program it. Um, they had the ability to work closely with industry professionals. So a part of being able to work with individuals who are actually doing that job is that you not only learn concepts and principles from them, but you learn about the job. So they had, were able to have conversations about, well, do you really do this every day? Is this what you get up and when you go to work? Do you actually think about these ideas? And what else do you do? Um, which is a part of the gap too. How do we get kids interested in wanting to be engineers and having a sense of what it is that engineers do every day? Well, how about talk to them? Um, they also had to do these review processes. So every few weeks, the engineers would come for a panel. And this is actually what happens when they get contracted by the government or other contractors. They do come periodically to see kind of, they go through these reviews, where are you now? Um, and they usually have prototypes that they test, and oftentimes they get told it's wrong, you have to do it over, or start over, or they've changed their mind um, in between, and then they have to revise. And so they had to go through these review processes where they had to explain to the engineers kind of where they got, what were some modifications they had to make, and then the engineers would give them feedback, and they would use that feedback to redesign and move on. Um, here, the engineers working with them on electronic surveillance. And so, this is kind of the final presentation when they built all of the different components of the project. And so we had a 16 by 16 foot um, the surface. And it was designed to look like a grid so that Algebra 1 students could actually work on it. And so you'll see the intruder. In this particular picture, the intruder did not get intercepted correctly. Um, so then they had to go and troubleshoot and figure out, well, you know, what happened, or their calculations off, and so on. So, 
So one of the things that was really exciting is that a lot of Algebra 1 students, they don't go through the process of you will fail, 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 and you have to keep going, right? Um, and that was a lesson that they learned from the engineers, that they're just like, we'll try 100 times that it will work once, and it's just a part of the job. And so we try to pound into students' perseverance and you know, and effort and those things are important parts of problem solving, but then having to actually do it and persevere, sometimes it's separate from the experience they have in mathematics classrooms. And then this was the picture of the big presentation at the end. And so they invited, I think, major um, people in the community, uh, the commander of the naval base came and um, they were really excited. So then, what did we collect? So we created these both disciplinary and interdisciplinary tests. Uh, the disciplinary tests really had questions that were pulled from released um, items from standardized tests that covered algebra, physics, and the core content. Um, we also had an interdisciplinary test that had them solving our problem that didn't look like the actual electronic dissection system, but had them integrating ideas. And then we also had interviews, interviewed the students about their experiences. And for each, all of the treatment classes, we also had a comparison um, control class, except for computer science, um, because we are working in rural districts and not every school has a computer science class. So this is just an example of the algebra item, um, and it looks fairly typical of what kids would need to know to, add, to answer a question about speed, um, distance, time graphs. And then this is the interdisciplinary test that it was situated in a context of a school at a basketball game. Um, and you know, having to set up a, a system, a set of system of lights that would actually um, change on a cycle, a time cycle, and so on. So they had to use some of their programming knowledge, they had to use some of their math knowledge to kind of figure out um, the optimal price for selling popcorn, which kind of brought in again the systems of equations that they've done before um, and so on. So not a problem resembling the chart. This is detection system, but involving them integrating ideas. So the results, uh, did they learn anything more than the control group in terms of algebra, physics, ROTC, POE, and computer science? Um, yes, they did, except for the class that we thought they would have learned the most. So in principles of engineering, the control group actually did much, much better than the treatment, the treatment group um, in every other class, the treatment group actually did better, um, even though most of the um, most of the, the, the differences are not statistically significant. So I know you're wondering why that happened. I'll come to that at the end because we were, you know, we weren't totally surprised by that outcome. Um, and this is just a graph showing the percent um, of students who did higher on the post test. The treatment group is in blue and the comparison group is in red. So we see that on the post test, just larger percentage of the students in the treatment group did better. So in terms of how the students kind of talked about the experience, because that was also important as well, we wanted them to learn, but we also had wanted them to have an enriching experience that would want them, make them want to find out more about engineering and also kind of push the school to have more of these kinds of opportunities. Um, so some of the, the statements from the students about creative and critical thinking was they, they really liked it because they had, to, they had opportunities to think outside the box. Um, they were finding different solutions that may not necessarily be what they had thought before. So this idea of having an initial, like a conjecture or initial approach, realizing it doesn't work and then kind of had to just make things up and figure it out. Um, they, had, they loved the collaboration. Every class had to work with either one, two, sometimes groups of four, um, and sometimes those groups changed around, but they really liked the opportunity to try things out, not only um, with my teacher, but with peers, um, and go through the, the, the rigor of, of trying and failing together. Um, they like this notion of, uh, when it comes to critical thinking, they talk about stating a problem, what you have to do to solve it, how you solved it, and then if it doesn't work, you kind of go back to it. Um, again, kind of talking through the engineering design process and the problem solving cycle. Um, and this notion of trying to figure out a problem, and there are multiple ways to do it, but it's really trying to figure out the best way. And some of these comments came primarily from the computer science class and principles of engineering class because 
the engineers constantly pushed them, even though they got the drone to work and it was moving in the right direction, was it moving at the, the, the optimal speed that it could, could we get it to go faster? So every time they thought that, yeah, great, we have a solution, it's moving, it's in a straight line, then they would say, okay, time it, let's see if next week we can get it to go faster. So it was just this constant push to improve and to get better, which is not really how schools are structured or experiences that they have all the time. There were hardware differences across classes. Um, if you went to the computer science class or the physics class, you would see a fundamentally different interaction than the algebra class. Um, and that came up in some of the comments. Um, so just by the nature of, of what the computer science students were doing, they were the ones who had to program the camera and set it up to actually detect the drone. So they got to try out a ton of cameras. This was a project that was really well funded. And so if they thought they wanted to have infrared sensors to sensor that we could buy infrared sensors. If they wanted heat sensors, we could buy the heat sensors. So every time they thought of something new, we had the opportunity to get it, they could try it, and then fail, like the heat sensor, which was really interesting, and they couldn't figure out why this was working. The robot is this big. It doesn't really generate that much heat. So every time it crossed over, they, it just would detect, and it took them like uh, six weeks to figure out why it wasn't picking it up. Then the engineer knew, but he just wouldn't tell them. And then they realized, oh, it's a little tiny robot. It's moving like a, you know, a really slow speed. It's not generating any heat from the it. It's really interesting. Um, so the, the computer science students really got to engage in the engineering design process. The algebra one students, not so much. Um, they felt like a lot of their learning was very, um, was very traditional. It was rare that they actually got to, to really explore and try new ideas. Because of what they had to do, they really had to go through doing a lot of calculations. If you think about the number of uh, calculations that they had to do, they had, they had eight entry points on the south wall to travel at three different speeds heading towards, um, and then the number of intersection points coming from the drone center. So for each possible speed at each possible point, they had to go ahead and calculate, I think about six different options of angles and speeds. And so just getting kind of bogged down in the, um, in the, um, the monotony of doing these calculations for them wasn't as exciting. Because if you think about it right now, we have computers that do that, like no human being. Um, and so that came out in some of the, the conversations. In terms of enge engineering design, um, the comments also reflected that they had a, a more real experiential perspective on this. So one comment was, we tested it in the electronic detection system. It failed multiple times. We started back and figured out our problem and then came back to testing until we finally got a solution. And so what were some of the other skills um, that they talked about? So although this was not a huge focus of what we were trying to get the kids to support, they did talk about the ways in which that they, they liked collaboration, they thought they were, got better at engaging conversation and presentation and collaboration over the time. They had to present every, to do the reviews once a month, so every four weeks they had to dress up professionally, put together a presentation, and engage with the engineers and talk about their thinking and their ideas and what had happened. And that was not something that was a regular part of what they did in school. Um, and so they thought that those particular skills were important, which was interesting because at the end of the project, although the company did not initially say that this was something that they valued, they really did talk about the importance of the employability skills and the fact that they thought that this was, although indirectly integrated into the program, it was a worthwhile outcome. Um, and then of course the rule of failure, which for me as a mathematics educator was hugely gratifying and satisfying because, I mean, one of the things that we know is really important for developing mathematical expertise is being accepting of the fact that you must make mistakes and you must be able to have a frame of mind and disposition to learn from those mistakes in order to get better. Um, so the fact that they started to value and see the purpose of that was, was really important. Um, so takeaways. With respect to the, the engineering class that we wondered why is it that they didn't, they actually um, decreased in knowledge, in the disciplinary knowledge over the, the course of the treatment, and a part of it was, that was a small class. They only had three students in the class, and the teacher had a very 
domineering presence over what it is that they did. Um, even sometimes the engineer had difficulty getting the students to, to think about and, and get them an opportunity to try the ideas that they had. Um, they're actually pictures from the, the final presentation day where she just actually completely took over what was going on um, when things were not working instead of having the students actually work on it and, and figure it out. She kind of took over and said, you know, here, here, here is, you know, is what's going on. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why we thought that the students, the opportunities that they had to learn were really diminished in the class because I think the teacher saw it as her opportunity to learn. Um, more so than the students. And so she, um, she monopolized a lot of the, the, the opportunities for the students in the class and also as they, you know, they were working with engineers. Another thing that we thought was um, we could improve on for the next runs, uh, our next cycles of our WSB was it really is supposed to also get kids to kind of systems think, um, meaning that it was really important for the different classes that were working on different subsystems to come together fairly frequently to talk about how their subsystems, their individual subsystems were gonna work together. Because of the way that the school day is structured and the classes are taught, that was very difficult. So over the course of a semester, they really only had three opportunities to talk across subsystems. Most of the communication happened amongst the engineers. So we had one engineer go to one class, and that's how they would break up. And then they would come together at the end of the day and kind of talk about where they went and plan for the next class. And so they would start the class by communicating what was going on in the other class, which really wasn't the role of, it should not have been the role of the engineers, it should have been the students who would have had that opportunity to do that. And so in the iteration, the implementation that we're doing this year, a part of the condition that we've had with the schools is that they have to restructure that entire half day um, so that this, the classes actually get to communicate with each other, because otherwise then it, it doesn't really work. Um, one thing that we learned too, um, and this probably would resonate with you, it's like asking a faculty member who's gotten a PhD um, to come to professional development and teaching. They just think they know it already. So they just not going to come. So with the engineers, engineers are engineers. They're used to working with other engineers who are experts. They're not trained to educate and work with students who are novices. Um, and so we, we, we forethought this and we wanted them to come to professional development just to kind of talk through probably what are some of the best ways to engage with kids. Um, and that was a struggle, so we let it go. And those were some of the challenges that, that occurred over the um, implementation. So instead of always allowing the kids to, to just work on it and just try it out, I mean, their patients, like that's not kind of how we work. If I, having a conversation with Sarah as a math, math educator as well, there are certain things that I don't have to explain to her, she knows. Um, and so it was a, sometimes it was pretty uncomfortable for them to kind of know how to navigate when, what do you mean you don't know this? Um, okay, I'll just tell you. Um, and as you know, that kind of diminishes the learning opportunity. We got a lot of that from the Algebra 1 students um, because if you worked with ninth graders, sometimes they take their time you know, learning concepts. And sometimes the engineers didn't really have that patience to kind of, you know, work through with them. That it takes some time to understand why, why we regard this as acceleration, and you know, why is this constant speed um, on a graph or how to represent that. Um, so one of the things that we have, we consider to be a significant problem of expanding this program um, more so than just with schools who are willing to be flexible, is that the way that US schools are designed and the way that they function, it's so rigid that you really have to have uh, a school district and a principal who's willing to kind of go beyond or step out of what they've normally done to see a change. And we like to talk about change and we like to talk about what it is that we want to see differently, but very few times are they willing to actually do what's necessary to actually have that change happen. Um, and so while schools will be, when they hear about the schools that we're working on, they get really excited and they want us to come to their school and do this. 
And then we talk about what it means for the, them in terms of the curriculum and structure of the schools and the teachers, um, then they're not as excited um, about doing it. Um, so it's, it has to be a rethinking about what education looks like, what it constitutes, what we really want for our students. Do we want them to be employable when they leave? Do we want them to learn? And then what is the cost of doing that? Thank you, Diane. That was fascinating, and I'm sure we're going to have plenty of questions. I have a question in terms of uh, schedule and time frame of the project, because the biggest problem we see introducing innovative teaching methods is the time that teachers want or can dedicate to those programs within the school classes, the, the class hours. So uh, this is the first question I have for you. So the, each teacher had to agree to allow us to work with their students for about 20% of the time in a semester. So we took them out of class, well, they were, you know, we had like a, the live speed lab um, for one period a week for the entire semester. And so that was our thinking in terms of if we're going to have one fifth of your time, then we need to make sure that you are okay with at least they're going to learn something that is going to be meaningful for the goals that you have for them. So purposeful thought and planning around that was important for us. And you did it within the class, normal classes, the class time. We did it within the class time, yeah. So if they had, they had algebra on Friday from 9 to 9.50, that was when they came to lab. Um, and then we also wanted the teachers to, to integrate the project as meaningful as they could into whatever they were doing during the week. Um, and that happens in varying degrees. Because I'm thinking about the scalability of a project like this. Uh, because if you think about what is the uh, problem to introduce it on a larger scale, the financing, of course, but also uh, as we, we have said before many times, the exams that the teachers actually yeah. need to prepare the students for. And we're working on this, how to actually within the, the time frame that we have. We spent about, um, and I'll again refer to the math because I was involved in, we spent three months aligning the curriculum and developing tasks and activities for, for just the math. And so we had a consultant for each subject. Who, who worked on doing that beforehand, and then we had professional development with the teachers um, prior to the start of the year. So, any other questions? Maybe I have one. Uh, you've been talking a, a bit about this, but the. Uh, uh, what was the difference of the teacher's attitude before and after the, the whole program? Did, did you see anything like this? I mean, uh, were they more enthusiastic before than, than after or, or the other way? Uh, was, what was their experience? Because we're talking, about, we're talking a lot about the student experience and okay. their... The teachers? Yeah. So the teachers, when they initially heard about the project, they weren't particularly excited. I think they, they liked the idea but they didn't necessarily want to give up class time to do this. And so when we told them that we were going to do the curricular alignment and we would be responsible for preparing the tasks, they just had to be willing to kind of support the project throughout and, and give us that time on a Friday, then they were more open. Um, and I would say the, the buy-in went like this over the course of the semester, but then the final day, it was a win-win for everybody. Everybody was now excited about doing this again. And I think a part of what gets teachers excited is when they see their students, they learn something. <laughs> and the students were really, really excited. Even the ones who were who gave us a hard time for the entire semester, on that presentation day, they wanted to talk to the engineers about what they did. They wanted to show off what their part of what they did. Um, and it was just overall a, a good experience. So even though you didn't see a lot of that from some students and teachers throughout the semester, on that last 
during the, we had the run-throughs, two run-throughs, and then the final day, everybody kind of shifted to, this is just, the, this is just wonderful. And so that, I think, um, got everybody to sign up for the next year. Conversations through the semester. Yeah, we're, we just finished another implementation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you think that you could do the same project without the funding? <laughs> so one of the, we, we said that we would, the goal was for us to, well, I used part of it, P16's part of it. We would support the schools for three years, and then after three years, then it would be sustainable without us. It can't be sustainable without the industry professionals. That's the whole model. Um, but they can do it with less funding. Um, they're free, with science, you know, they're consumable materials. So the sensors will only work for so long. And to really have kids be able to try out different things, they can reuse the range of cameras that we bought. But some years, some kids are going to say, let's try this. Technology changes and improves. And so there has to be some funding, I think, for it to really have the authenticity that we want. For, um, for the kids to have, but not nearly as much as that initial year. Because most of the other stuff, the poles for the cameras, the tarp, all of those things can, they're so beautiful. Just one last question. Just in terms of collaboration, um, I don't know, and you might need to elaborate did the students have to collaborate with one another in order to do the tasks in teams, or were they, were they pretty much individually um, expected to do their own project or to? Re no, they had to collaborate. Um, that was. Was that a sticky or difficult process? No, actually, they they, they wanted even if though they weren't really doing it a lot in especially the outdoor classes, they really wanted to. That was not a fight that we had to have, as a matter of fact. The Algebra 1 students were disgruntled that they didn't get to collaborate more. The other classes did a good job, the computer science and physics, they collaborated a lot. Um, so they, kids want that. Did you, you have a structure for that, or that it was just spontaneous to just get together and figure uh -huh. something out? Uh, no, the, in some classes, the teachers, the teachers designed the groups. In other classes, they were able to um, to create their own groups. Some groups changed, like they started working with some students and then they changed. It's high school. Someone, there was a couple in one group, they broke up, they had to change groups. You know? <laughs> um, so, it, yeah, the dynamic sometimes doesn't work and so they change around, but yeah, it differed across class. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak to you all today. And um, my name is Maria Samborska, and I'm a, a faculty member of the School of Education of Polish American Freedom Foundation and the University of Warsaw. Um, I'm also a doctoral student on, uh, in mathematics education uh, in the Pedagogical University of Krakow. Um, I used to work as a teacher, mathematics uh, school teacher and academic teacher, uh, but recently um, the field I'm mostly involved in is uh, pre-service and in-service um, teachers training, mathematics teachers training. Uh, and this is, uh, as you can see from the title of the talk, the area um, um, my research is also focused in. Um, so uh, let me begin with a little explanation um, about why I chose uh, to study mathematical discussions. Um, in Poland, as in the great majority of other countries, uh, there has been a shift in the national curriculum uh, in recent decades, uh, a shift from um, proficiency in algorithms and procedures towards uh, the more deep understanding of mathematics, towards uh, reasoning, explaining, justifying, um, and 
uh, but the, reali the re reality is that teachers didn't uh, receive enough support in making these changes. Uh, and what is typical for Polish mathematical, mathematical classroom is uh, teachers standing in the center and doing the most of talking and unfortunately also the most of thinking. Um, and um, we know that this traditional model of teaching does not uh, serve well in uh, promoting mathematical understanding. Uh, so this, uh, there is a serious need for finding new methods. Actually, there are a lot of new methods, but uh, we have a problem with implementing them in a Polish uh, environment. Um, so even if we have the greatest task that can promote understanding, um, when you teach traditionally, uh, you probably don't uh, have your students thinking. Um, and I believe, and research uh, confirms, that um, mathematics discussions can be uh, a good response to this need. So um, we tried in the School of Education, in our program for uh, teach mental teachers, uh, we tried to um, teach them um, elements of mathematical discussions. And when I'm talking about mathematical discussion, I mean um, an activity in which students are engaged in thinking and talking about mathematics. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, our first attempts uh, weren't very successful. Um, it turned out that um, the tradition of this transmissive model of teaching is so strong that it's very, very difficult to make a significant change. Uh, so, the idea of um, a design research study emerged, uh, a study um, which would help develop the program for implementing um, the method of mathematical discussion. Um, and design research uh, study is uh, a way of studying new forms of instruction and it has two goals. Uh, creating a successful product, in this case a course for our mental teachers, and the second goal, developing useful new knowledge which will uh, help um, to revise the product and make it better the next time. Um, and it's an iterative process of designing, analyzing, uh, implementing changes. Um, and it's a cycle in which uh, the theory of practice and practice inform theory. Um, and what has been done so far, and what I want to talk about today, um, is the first iteration of uh, this process. Uh, so it's a pilot study um, in which uh, our mental teachers um, took part. Um, it was a five-week personal development course, uh, which was uh, designed based on research. Um, and the design was uh, put um, this way, which would um, help us uh, um, to have much insight about how this learning happened. Because what we want to know is how to um, create these learning trajectories for our mental teachers, how to help them implement these changes in the work. Okay, so the idea, the main idea was uh, to break this traditional way of teaching, of communication, of communicating with students, uh, which in Polish classrooms usually take two forms. Uh, it's either IRE pattern in which um, teacher initiates conversation, student gives a uh, short response and teacher evaluates the statement and it goes like John what is 7 times 8? 54? No, Stephanie? 55? Right. And uh, the second form of conversation typical for Polish classrooms is uh, funerally described by Wood um, and 
it looks a little bit better, but it's much it's much serious problem because uh, it can look like it can look like that. What is given in this problem? The baseline. What else? The area. What should we find behind? Which formula are we going to use? So teacher um, provides every single step of thinking or reasoning for the student. But unfortunately, many many teachers think that it's a very effective way of communicating with students, and this is the problem because and um, the research uh, describe it like uh, as um, the illusion of learning. So actually the teacher makes uh, the whole job, but the teacher thinks that all the class did the thing. Um, and the metaphor I chose to um, describe the idea of the course was uh, uh, the metaphor of uh, exchanging the ping pong form of communication uh, into a basketball one. So we want, uh, uh, we want to have longer sentences uh, in the space of classroom, we want uh, uh, the ball going from one student to another, not uh, all the time from the teacher to students and back. And, and the metaphor actually served uh, quite well uh, with our uh, participants uh, because um, it's really hard to imagine probably um, those of you who uh, have, have been for at least once in the classroom or uh, I don't know, in an environment where uh, such communication, good communication takes place, can imagine the structure and know how it should look like. But our teachers who spend many, many thousands of hours uh, watching or doing the traditional uh, way of teaching, they don't have the image of, of uh, okay. So, um, the theoretical background is uh, three levels and um, the base is uh, social constructivism and um, the framework to think about um, designing the course uh, we've chosen uh, is um, a framework um, by Grossman and colleagues um, which, who, who describe representations, decomposition and approximations of practice. Uh, and these three terms were uh, the key terms in designing the course. Um, the representations um, can be, for example, video records or uh, lesson plans or modeling by the tutor. Uh, but, um, and of course, video records are very good representations, but uh, we decided not to use them because we don't have good examples from Polish classrooms, but we have, uh, and we tried to use American examples. But um, it, it's very difficult because teachers uh, say that. Um, it, it should be, it, it probably um, would, um, won't work here because it's different culture or even they um, say that probably it was, uh, you know, planned, it, it, it could, couldn't be real. Um, so we just not different representations, but um, the composition of, uh, searching for the composition of uh, practice uh, so small chunks of leading the discussion that can be um, implemented individually uh, was um, a difficult job, and, but uh, the research helped us um, and some local instruction theories. Uh, and approximation of practice um, was the most um, interesting choice because uh, we decided to use um, three types, the three types of approximations, uh, formulating questions by uh, participants, scripting, um, and lesson place. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this uh, type of task. Uh, I see some notes, but not too much, so I will uh, tell about it uh, in a second. Um, and rehearsals. 
so there are kinds of uh, simulations in which teachers can um, try some new moves uh, before they will go to the classroom. Um, and of course, it, the course was during the school year, so um, the parallel real practice at school uh, took place. Um, and um, we uh, chose um, a few simple strategies that teachers can implement easily in, in daily practice. And the first one, and it turned out that it was the most um, successful one, was turn and talk. Uh, no one of our particip participants knew uh, actually how to use this method before. Um, and also five moves, five top moves to support classroom discuss discussions. Uh, Revoicing, so par paraphrasing what students said. Repeating, uh, so asking another student to repeat in the, his own words what another student said. Um, reasoning, asking why, do, do you agree, do you don't agree and why. Adding on, uh, asking students uh, if they want to add something on. Um, and using wait time. And um, I thought that using wait time would be the easiest one. And we chose it as the first move uh, introduced for, uh, in the course. And it turned out that it was the most difficult one. <laughs> Uh, and we also tried to teach them how to lead the mini discussion. Uh, so a little structure, a few minutes structure, which, which contains uh, these previous moves. But in five week course, it turned out that it was impossible. It was too too quick for them. Um, okay. So um, a few more sentences about uh, lesson plan because it was. Um, the most interesting and giving us the most uh, insight uh, type of task uh, we gave our participants. So um, lesson play is um, a modification of lesson plan in which we don't plan all activities, but we try to um, hypothesize about a possible course of the lesson. Uh, so. Um, Participants were just scripting, um, writing dialogues which could have happened. Um, and we built on the research of uh, Rina Tsatskis and her colleagues uh, and used the prompts they um, tried and they decided are, um, had, uh, had the most potential of rich mathematical discussion. Uh, and uh, sorry, and um, the part of the task was to use in every um, lesson play, every script, um, teachers had to use at least three different um, talk moves to practice how, how to use them. Um, okay, so we have 22 participants, most of them are mental teachers, um, and five weeks course in which four first weeks was um, an, an online work and the last week was a meeting with uh, simulations and uh, rehearsals. Um, and a lot of uh, data uh, came from uh, this study, but uh, as I said before, dialogues produced by um, teachers were the most interesting part. And we um, analyzed it um, and looked for the parts that were, the, the elements of the course uh, which were easy, which were difficult for the teachers, um, <coughs> what are the strengths of our teachers, what are common misunderstandings. And um, I want to share with you a few results which are. Uh, of course, very um, you know local, but I just want to give you um, a sense of what kinds of uh, implications we have for planning the next uh, iteration of the course. Uh, so it turned out that uh, these of our mental teachers who <coughs> experienced uh, 
uh, an activity of recording and analyzing their own lesson were the ones who um, um, made the greatest progress because they understood that what they thought before is working actually is not. So they felt a need for change. So the plan is uh, to start with this activity, although we know that it's very difficult, for, especially if uh, you do it for the first time. Um, as I said before, Tarant Talk was the uh, most uh, successfully uh, implemented strategy. Uh, probably it's before because it's a very little structure which can be easily built into different tradition, even traditional part of uh, lessons. Um, and but uh, the great potential of Tarant Talk. Uh, lies in teacher monitoring students' uh, discussions in pairs um, and building the next steps of instruction based on what uh, she heard. And this was something that almost all uh, our participants uh, ignored. So the lesson for us is uh, not, not to try uh, to do all of this at the same time. And maybe um, um, introducing different methods, uh, think per share, and then talking about this monitoring would be better. Um, from these five top moves uh, I mentioned, um, adding on and reasoning were the two which were um, picked uh, for the most uh, of the time when uh, the teachers uh, scripted uh, their dialogues. But uh, adding on um, was understood well, uh, except uh, of maybe three teachers who used this term, uh, this question, would someone like to add on to this, not as an opening question, uh, but rather as a closing question. So it was, would someone like to add on to this? No? Okay, so we can go further. Uh, but most of the teachers used um, this term properly in terms that uh, it really evolved uh, some other insights into discussion. Um, and reasoning, so the question do you agree or disagree and why was the second um, um, often, most often um, cho chosen strategy, uh, but in more than half of these um, choices, uh, teachers asked only the first part of the question. So they asked, do you agree or disagree? And they didn't ask why. So it, it, uh, it's not very helpful in uh, engaging students in discussion. Um, okay, so the, mm, the prompts, um, which concern students' mistake, uh, like the ones I showed you before, um, concerning uh, prime numbers and uh, factors, um, they uh, were they had the most potential. When the starting point was different, for example, uh, two different strategies showed, and uh, the dialogue that teachers produced wasn't so rich, so I think it's a good point of starting uh, using these sessions. Um, and the most important um, uh, result is that what we thought would happen, so we thought that uh, these mini discussions at the end of the course would uh, uh, go well, did so uh, there is a big gap in this approximation because from um, just scripting a lesson play to really trying to conduct some activity, um, this is two big steps. So we uh, want to put something in the middle and maybe um, some online tool would be good, an online tool in which uh, 
two teachers can script together, but one um, is, uh, has a teacher role and the second one uh, has students role, roles. And what uh, will happen in the next step, uh, we will probably know uh, by the end of next year, and uh, I hope I can tell you about that uh, at our next meeting. interesting to me, but the fact that you really uh, talked specifically about classroom engagement through conversation and these conversational moves is very, very relevant, so thank you very much for that. Um, I'd also like to ask you, you had, mentioned, oops, uh, you had mentioned, you had mentioned recording and the teachers who recorded, was the recording voluntary by the teachers? You said that they were the ones who tended to improve the most or benefit the most of uh, those who recorded and, uh, and then analyzed the lessons. And then the second question I have is, when you talk about scripting, do you mean 
um, lesson planning, or do you mean scripting out specifically what you're going to say and the turn taking? Uh, when I'm talking about scripting, as Lina Tsatsky is um, defined this uh, task, uh, I'm thinking about scripting actual words that teacher or students could say. Um, and um, I think maybe I could uh, ask um, Magda uh, to help me answer uh, for the first question because uh, the video taking uh, their own lessons was a part of personal development for our mental, mental teachers, uh, I think two years ago, uh, probably. Um, yeah. Magda, can you, uh, do you want to yes. add on to this? It's part of development of our mental teacher because we collaborate with some kind of clinical schools in Warsaw and we have a group of 17 mental teachers and uh, half of them are, uh, are not teachers, so it was a part of development and some kind of recruitment for them. So uh, these who wanted to be our mental teachers had to do this and show us, but uh, some of them volunteered also to um, uh, show this uh, video report uh, to other mental teachers and discuss it uh, collaboratively.
uh, leisure activities. But um, and girls and boys are usually sitting in the same classroom with the same teacher, and so it's unlike race or SES related gaps in the United States, uh, gender is just more of a puzzle in this case. Um, and again, we know girls tend to do well in school top material and they exhibit better approaches to learning. So if, you know, in these surveys of U.S. teachers and students, we can see that girls consistently are more likely to stay on task and do what they're told in school. Uh, in fact, after looking at decades of, of work on this, we've wondered if maybe girls' on-task behavior could be a problem, and that um, there are certainly benefits to this in the short run, but might there be a downside when it comes to mathematical problem solving if you're constantly doing what you're told to do instead of maybe trying to think outside the box more? And that's where some of this uh, work has come from. Uh, so we've looked actually at literature on problem solving approaches and have noticed that there's this lurking, uh, recurring pattern, this theme where girls tend to use more familiar teacher given strategies and boys are more likely to invent their own strategies. These have tended to be small scale studies of maybe you know, 10 or 20 kids. And, um, but it's, it fits a more general pattern of girls perhaps being more risk averse and boys being more likely to tinker in science and computer science. There have been some work on tinkering and who's more likely just to kind of mess around with the materials that you hand out and figure out stuff. And there have been gender differences noticed there. So uh, we've had lingering questions, and that is to what extent do these differences in problem-solving approaches exist at the top of the achievement distribution where we're seeing these differences in test scores? And might differences in problem-solving approaches explain sex differences in problem-solving performance? So might there be a link between these problem-solving approaches and, and how students are actually doing? Might this explain uh, some of the differences we see in boys' and girls' achievement? Uh, but in order to try to get at this, uh, we need a valid, reliable measure designed to capture sex differences in students' problem-solving approaches. And so uh, this led us to this idea of, well, what, what are we really thinking is happening here? What do we call it? And so we started calling this bullet problem solving, which involves approaching math problems in inventive ways as opposed to adhering to more familiar teacher-given rules. And so a bullet problem solver might play around with an unfamiliar problem and, and try to invent a solution strategy instead of just uh, using a more conventional given method or seeking help. So this uh, relates to some other things that exist out there, like flexible problem solving. But flexible is not really quite what we're going for, since flexible can mean like choosing among established strategies. Um, and uh, Pete Kusterman and Stage had a difficult problem survey skill that is more about confidence to solve difficult problems. And so we, we have administered that alongside what we've been doing just to kind of see correlations. But that's not quite what we're getting at either. Um, as we go into this work, we have some dilemmas and some thinking, you know, things we're thinking about. One is that we don't assume that um, compliance and boldness are somehow innate or fixed, but we think this is a malleable thing that kids can learn to do differently. Um, we also acknowledge that amid a lot of calls for intersectional work and thinking of gender as a fluid social construction, this work on boys and girls' differences in problem solving approaches is, in a way, just feels very counter to that. Um, and, raises the question of might we perpetuate deficit perspectives of girls. Uh, one thing that we're thinking about, though, is boldness or risk taking might sound like a good thing in some contexts, but it may not be all good. And there may only be payoff of that at the top of the achievement distribution. It's not clear to us that uh, we would even see the same results that we see at the top of the distribution throughout the distribution. Uh, but these are still things that we're, that we're worried about. So given that we have these persistent um, gas at the top of the achievement distribution, and ultimately in these high status, high paying careers. And in fact, if you look at the percentage of the wage gap between US men and women that are accounted for by just what types of professions they're going in, it's very related to this. Um, but it seems important to examine whether differences in boys and girls problem solving approaches might contribute to these gaps in performance and why these differences exist. So in this study, we tried to um, take a first stab at developing a valid and reliable self-report survey measure, something that we could more easily distribute and collect data from, from many kids at, at one time uh, down the road um, of, of these bold problem-solving tendencies, we're calling them. Uh, again, not thinking that they're fixed, but that they're how students are tending to uh, approach problems. And then also examine the extent to which sex differences in this self-reported 
problem-solving approaches measure might explain sex differences in problem-solving performance along with potential reasons why that might be the case. And I'll, uh, we have three sort of hypotheses for why sex might relate to bold problem-solving. One is this orientation toward pleasing the teacher, another is math confidence, and another one is spatial skills, since much literature has shown uh, larger gaps in mental rotation skills and math confidence than in actual math achievement. So uh, for this study, we had 79 high-achieving U.S. 8th graders, these are like 13 and 14 year olds. Um, it was primarily white and Asian students in a selective five-year high school, and so these were um, these kids had come from 17 different middle schools a year before, so anything we see, it's not necessarily, you know, it's particular to that one school context because these, these kids did come from all over. We administered several different measures. I'm not talking about all of them today, but a bold problem solving survey, which included these items. And these are things that we, um, for the most part, came up with to try to get at this idea of bold problem solving. So I won't read them all, but some of them are, I prefer inventing my own ways to solve math problems instead of applying procedures my teacher or textbook shows me. Or I enjoy working on challenging math problems that don't have a set way of solving them. Or a reverse coded item, when I solve math problems, I almost always follow the procedures when I'm in class, etc. Um, not all of these made the final cut into our measure. The uh, bottom two got dropped. I'll explain a little more in a second. Um, we also administered a new confidence scale. So one thing that is very annoying to me <laughs> is when I look, use national data, when they measure confidence, they usually have items that kind of are counteracting each other if I'm trying to look at gender. So they have, I get good grades in math, and girls do get good grades in math, and they put that together with, I think I'm great at math, or I, you know, I'm good at math, which girls don't say yes to that so much. So our scale really tries to get at the I feel like I'm good at math piece of that. Um, so that we could really try to unpack the gender piece of this. Um, here are descriptive statistics of those eight initial bold problem solving items. The bottom two, um, for sake of time, I won't get into why we dropped them, but we dropped those bottom two. And we uh, used the top six items as a scale for bold problem solving. Um, it had a decent reliability. We are in the process, actually, we have just finished collecting more data and using more items to try to, to up, try to up that reliability. But there's actually almost a full standard deviation difference in these high achieving boys and girls scores on this problem solving uh, approaches self-report scale. Uh, so that alone was interesting to us because these were all kids who scored at the top, you know, five to ten percentile on, on this math <coughs> admissions test, and um, yet they were really reporting very different ways of approaching problems. So can this bold problem solving tendencies measure help explain the gender gap in problem solving performance? Um, and then what might, what might explain the gender differences in these tendencies? So that's the next two questions we want to get at. And again, we had these three hypotheses for what might explain that. So we had this first model of we just wondered about the relationship between sex and problem solving performance and whether bold problem solving tendencies mediates that. And then we were looking at these three possible reasons of why. Although the why, I mean, take all the causal stuff with a, with a grain of salt, but it's, it's getting us uh, to, to think about that, but it's not definitively why. Um, so the please the teacher scale, this existed already. It's not our favorite, and um, I, there are things here that are pretty general about, like, I do the work because that's what school is about, and that's not quite about please the teacher, but we use the scale because we didn't want to reinvent a scale if we didn't need to, but um, this convinced us we probably do need to do a little more work on this based on how things shook out, but it's fine. Uh, math confidence, this was our attempt again to create a better math confidence scale for looking at gender, and this came up with a very high reliability, so that this I'm happy with. And then spatial skills, we use the Vandenberg bench rotation test where if you look at the left, um, you need to find that the two shapes on the right that match the one on the left. Um, anyone want to call out one, two, three, or four for what matches the one on the left? I'm not even sure of the answers here. Oh, I do. What do you say? Four, yeah, four is one of them. And one, yeah, one and four. So um, these are tough items. They're, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I have circles on them. Oh, good. I have notes for myself. All right. And then we needed a measure of problem solving performance. And so we uh, went to an old study of SAT problems that had gender differences on them and contacted the authors and tried to get uh, the items and, and get some data on them. So we actually chose five of those items after piloting with some kids. Um, and we use those five items as, as a problem solving measure that could be done in a reasonable amount of time with kids. And so these are just some of them. So most of you aren't math people, I won't belabor this. Um, 
so is this descriptive statistics? Because <laughs> I know we're running short of time. Oh, yes, uh oh. Just right. real quick, how old are the kids again? Oh, sorry, um, eighth, advanced eighth graders, so 13, 14 years old. So just a few descriptive statistics. Um, but please, the teacher, there wasn't a significant gender difference, which again is my red flag that I'm not sure I love that scale. Uh, math confidence, almost a full standard deviation in that uh, difference. Again, mental rotation skills actually over a full standard deviation difference. The bold problem solving tendencies, as we said, is almost a standard deviation. And then on those five SAT items, um, there's actually, uh, girls got less than two right, and boys got just over three right, so, and that ended up being a uh, uh, three quarters of a standard deviation difference. And then if we look at the SSAT scores, which is this test that's, uh, that the kids took to get into the selective high school, there was no difference in verbal and reading and the quantity of the boys were ahead, but not nearly as far ahead in that as they were on these other measures that we administered. So um, there was you know, quite a few correlations we could talk about. Um, Please, the teacher was negatively correlated with math confidence. Mental rotation was um, positively correlated with confidence. The bold problem solving tendency scales was negatively correlated with the please the teacher behaviors or orientation, but positively correlated with math confidence and mental rotation. And then the actual problem solving performance was related to you know, confidence rotation and both. Okay. So there's a lot of relationships going on here. Um, and again, a sample of 79, so it's, it's not as if this is you know, 70,000 kids where everything's significant. So when you see something significant, it's probably a sizable thing. Um, so again, we, we know that there's a difference based on this descriptive, descriptives that there's a difference in uh, boys and girls' problem solving performance. Uh, we do see a significant path where uh, once we uh, put in both problem solving tendencies in this path analysis, uh, the actual relationship from sex to problem solving performance is no longer a significant 1.03, but it's an insignificant 0.46, I and mean, we have this path. So it looks as if both problem solving tendencies is helping explain a big chunk of that gender gap. Um, and then, well, what might explain why we have this sex difference in both problem solving tendencies? Um, without going too far into the details, it looks like math confidence was, is the winner here in terms of helping us see why boys and girls might be taking different problem solving approaches. Maybe that they have the confidence to take that risk, run on a limb, and think that they can uh, come up with their own way of doing it. However, um, in looking at the different uh, data, the mental rotation was highly aligned with sex, and it did relate to bold problem solving tendencies, but not when we got confidence in the model. So we ran an alternative one where one mediator between sex and confidence seems to be mental rotation. So it could be that boys with um, stronger mental rotation skills have more confidence and then use more bold strategies. Again, is this all causal? I can't be sure, but the paths are um, significant there. So just a summary of the findings on this. The scores on the bold problem solving measure appear to explain a substantial portion of the gender differences in the problem solving performance. Math confidence explains some of that gender difference in, in bold problem solving tendencies. And mental rotation may mediate that relationship between sex and confidence. Um, and I do wonder, can this construct help us enhance math achievement and equity more broadly? So is this not just for helping girls to you know, solve problems more effectively, but could it help us think about other groups? Um, again, am I digging up with uh, data from Poland? It looks like there may be parallel concerns about problem solving in Poland and that Polish students, um, the gap between the top score in PISA nations and Poland's data uh, or uh, performance is larger on non-routine problems than on other types of math skills. So it may be an argument for paying more attention to problem solving skills here as well as a, a, in the US. Um, so again, attention to bold problem solving might help us enhance our, uh, the achievement of other groups, low SES students who some, uh, there's some research to suggest that they tend to uh, have more of an obedience to authority orientation coming from working class jobs requiring that type of orientation. This is again controversial terrain, which I tend to find myself in all the time, uh, but there may be uh, some usefulness there. And um, Macy Golson's art article about black girls being uh, perceived as maybe more assertive than other girls. It, that raises a question for me, how would this play out in a sample of black students in the US? I don't know. So for future work, we want to test this with broader populations. I'm a little bothered that the scale right now kind of has preference for, bold pro preference for complex problems that don't have a set solution, as well as ways that students solve problems. And I'm wondering, as we add more items, might this shape into a two-construct thing or not? 
Uh, we're going to add questions to increase the reliability of this and understand what, more about this construct. Uh, I'm also wondering if this could be a diagnostic tool, for example, in the college level, if we know that beginning engineering majors, some students don't have a full problem solving orientation, might we be able to flag those as folks that need some intervention in the way that some have done with spatial skills. Um, and our team is continuing to grapple with this term bold problem solving and whether that's the best term to use, and I'm really happy to get feedback from you all on that at this point. So that's it. Thanks. Thank you very much. The microphone is back. We have some questions. I wonder what would be your interpretation of uh, mental rotation difference, set difference. Uh, it can be um, that these are previous uh, experiences which drive uh, this really, right? So uh, boys are better in mental rotation because they are more often engaged in uh, Types, uh, these types of uh, tasks, uh, even in real life, not only in school, that require <laughs> this skill, right? So you mean like uh, construction projects at home or that kind yeah, of thing? I mean, or, yeah, I mean, uh, different hypotheses are out there. So yes, there's this. This is a thing in the literature. I mean, to be honest, when I started this work, I was interested in the bold problem solving thing, and I thought mental rotation was just this annoying thing that people kept telling me I had to look at, but I did not care about it. But the more I've gotten into this, I'm like, yeah, this is a thing, and it's it's big, and the difference is really large. And uh, even among these very high achieving kids across the board, it's still big. Um, so. We know that it's malleable, that if, if you spend six weeks trying to train kids on this, you can. And girls have been found out, for example, in an engineering intervention, girls drop out of their engineering programs less if you give them spatial skills training. Where it's coming from, I mean, I hear things like video games, Legos, you know, in terms of early ages, I don't know. I don't feel like I've seen a definitive study that really says where is this coming from. You want to jump in on that? Yeah, I want to add that, add something to that. Actually, I think the most uh, right theory is this Bentwick theory that you have like initial differences between the genders, and gradually uh, during the education and experience, you you know the the Bentwicks <coughs> the, the the twig bends because uh, you know you you fail more uh, the girls fail more uh, than than, uh, than the boys and. They tend to develop this uh, uh, learned helplessness, perhaps, maybe. I was, this was my master's thesis. <laughs> between girls who were kind of raised like boys versus girls who tended to, you know, go through activities and experiences that were typical of girls, um, like what we would regard as a tomboy. Right. Um, and if, if that's one of the proposed theories that it might be the kinds of activities that they're engaged in early on that are more outdoor tumbling, I mean, just even when you think about how boys navigate space and what they get to do outside, there has to be some form of spatial and spatial manipulation to not always fall back or kill yourself. Like, figure out where you, I mean, the things that my brother and I would do, sometimes I wonder how we're alive now, because, but you, you know, you kind of build these things in here. Um, so, has, do you know? Yeah, I don't know if anyone has done that. I mean, I wondered the same thing with transgender kids now. I mean, the biggest study that we did, we've got, I mean, a sizable number, but not, still not enough for me to really yeah. do anything with. But if we had endless money and sample, it would yeah. Yeah, be interesting. Um, yeah, to find such girls might be right. difficult. But um, And then the, the second thing, when you talked about African-American girls, I wondered if they might be more assertive, but they also have low 
efficacy was related to math because of just societal stereotypes, etc. So that might be something that would it, they'd be high on one end, but then low on the other end, so you might end up seeing similar results because of that, given that self-efficacy is a, a factor that influences. Sarah, I'm going to miss this, but have you ground truth the bold problem solving tendencies to see if they actually solve problems boldly? Okay, <laughs> yes. This was, okay. how much time do I have? <laughs> Negative, probably. Um, a side trip of this that I did not feel I had time to go into was we did some qualitative analyses of about half the kids. So we did think a lot of interviews with, um, we had decent data on 32 kids. Um, one, and we did not see clear patterns, and I think there's two things going on. One thing is that, one thing we noticed is that in the think aloud condition, every, regardless of whether they were boys or girls, they got one problem out of five less correct. They, I think they were taking too long to think out loud, or they were not able to concentrate because they were doing this weird think aloud thing. Even though we had read up on how to do this and don't ask them questions and don't do this, just say, keep talking, you know. Um, it was still very striking that the kids in the think aloud condition just did much worse. And so I'm not sure I trust the data we collected from the think aloud condition in terms of being how kids would actually naturally solve those problems. Um, the other thing that we got into is the problems were chosen, these five problems were chosen because they, um, because they had no gender differences, but they weren't really chosen because they're great at helping us see different ways to solve a problem, if that makes sense. Like I would, in retrospect now, if I was strictly going to do a qualitative study on how boys and girls solve problems differently, I wouldn't choose these items. But I mean, our main thing was the quantitative stuff. But we ran into so many dilemmas about like, is this bold? Is that bold? How do you hold boldness? You know? And so a kid who, on this problem about find five numbers where the average is, you know, 27, and you know, you know the, the first four. You know, if you try every number under the sun, is that bold? Yeah. Did you try any problems that were not immediately identifiable as mathematical? No. I mean, they were all SAT math items, if that makes sense. So maybe try that, because that for me would be where I would, I would see, I think, bold problem solving. Mm -hmm. I think for for these kids, and again I'm speculating, but just in terms of what I see kids do, their brain goes into math mode, mm -hmm. even if it's both problem solving within math, and there are ways that they approach math problems from experience. So if girls were in their prior experience before they got to the school, expected to do math in this way, and it looks like math, then they kind of default into that kind of... And that's exactly another problem that we had, is that we didn't know what they had before. So for some kids who might do a really cool thing, it might have been taught to them. Like, yeah. you know, and it was 30 years ago, it would have been easier to say they didn't learn this cool strategy in school. But now, I don't know. I mean, this was another favorite example. I actually did the interview on this kid, and they could not remember how to do long division for the life of them, which actually a surprising number of these super high achieving eighth graders could not remember how to do long division. Good. She yeah. just subtracted, you know, 40 and 80 over and over and took her like, you know, this was a computation that it was kind of a side thing, this computation stuff. But anyway, there were lots of dilemmas about is this bold? <laughs> do you have to be correct to be bold? I mean, so there's when we get into the weeds, it's 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 much more muddy. So yeah. So yes, we tested it. No, we have to know. Like yes, it's awesome. So, so what was the decision about using the it's pre SAT right kind of items? The SS, so it's real SAT items okay. were used, but the SSAT scores are what we had for like all okay. rounds. Does that make sense? Yeah. So was there any conversation when you were thinking about items whether to use pro these the SAT items or to, or to try or integrate them with items that were not traditional kind of looking at items? No, because I mean our goal was to get a measure that we knew we could get gender differences on because we we were just trying to explain the gender gap performance, not explore it. If that makes sense, you know what I'm saying? Because our main goal was to, to develop this self-reported measure to try to explain the gender gap. So we just needed items that would give us a gender gap. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah
But if we're going to do more work on trying to observe boldness in action, we have to go to a different route. So yeah, that's where your comments are helpful. I, I guess I was commenting on, um, and maybe this is not what Adam was asking, but if you saw any evidence of what, OK, so there's a self-measure, mm -hmm. measure if you're bold. Mm -hmm. But then could you verify that in terms of were they really doing bold things? Right. In their and, and because of all these reasons, like I'm not sure we were solving them the same way, and because what bold is, if when you're looking at it, depends on what they knew in the past, and, and if, if, so no. I, I mean, we, we looked at half the kids doing these items. These items were not helpful, and the think aloud situation was not helpful for really getting at this. We need new things. Yeah. Okay, I regret to stop this <laughs> discussion. Your fantastic presentation. Thank you very much once again.